thank you, Fabrice. Uh, thanks to the French consulate, um, to um, Mati Bunzel on the, the Chicago Humanities Festival, uh, and to Dolores Cole Kaplan. And a warm welcome to, to all of you. Uh, I know you are expecting uh, a couch, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> Professor Cristeva has agreed to analyze me sitting up. Uh, and, and, and of course, you didn't come. The, the speaking subject you came to hear was not me, but Professor Cristeva. Um, this is an extraordinary honor and, and pleasure for me. Uh, Professor Kristeva has altered the way that we think about so many different issues. Um, she's altered the very terms of so many different disciplines, anthropology, ethics, philosophy. I, I could go on and name, name a number. Um, Professor Kristeva, the, the, the late Tony Jutt uh, referred to you as one of the last great public intellectuals. And I think uh, implicit in that description was a kind of sense or perhaps even a lament that the space for public intellectuals was diminishing in today's culture. And I was wondering with what you think about or, or how you feel your, your position your authority in relationship to public culture has shifted over the years, or whether you've encountered new, new challenges in, in occupying the space of someone who speaks to the public on intellectual issues and matters? Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult question, and I would like to, to answer to it by, by some more personal reflection, and then I, I think uh, that I'll go more directly to, to the purpose uh, that you submit to us today, uh, and which is, if I understood you well, uh, to answer if I feel like the last <laughs> big, I suppose, yes. uh, public intellectual. Uh, let me say that uh, I suppose it's a compliment. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that uh, you speak about somebody else I, it's very difficult for me to recognize myself in, in this compliment, if it is. Uh, and in the same time, I, I know that uh, maybe for some people in this audience uh, and some students that I have the chance to, to meet uh, in different countries uh, beyond France, uh, be it in Europe or in the United States or in China, um, I, uh, they, they have uh, read my work in, in English and they um, follow some ideas that they, they discuss and that uh, this reading uh, helps them in their everyday life. Uh, so maybe mm, if you understand this last big intellectual in this sense, uh, I can accept this compliment. But let me say first that uh, mm, when you present me like this, in, in front of the auditory that I don't see because of the dark uh, <laughs> mise-en-scene, um, I, I think about uh, uh, the identity that I'm supposed to, uh, to incarnate or to, um, to, to, to present on this uh, stage. Uh, of course, uh, the, the first thing uh, that comes in mind is that uh, my identity is very multiple. I'm from Bulgarian origin, uh, French citizen, uh, I'll say European nationality, and I say very often that I'm by American, in American adoption, uh, because um, when I came from Bulgaria in France uh, on the eve of Christmas 65, with a scholarship given by this great visionary uh, it was uh, General de Gaulle uh, in order to make um, a thesis on the Nouveau Roman. Uh, the French uh, university was quite traditional and conventional, I'll say. And the disciplines like uh, uh, structuralism or philosophy and uh, psychoanalysis uh, applied to literary work uh, were not admitted in the university. Uh, a little bit in l'école des hautes études, but not in the university. And it was in the American universities 
that I found um, uh, a space to present my work and was uh, very much encouraged by the American Academy. And I want to thank to this Academy that you represent today uh, this hospitality. Uh, in the same time, I, I want to, to say something as an apology to our audience. My English is a, a very primitive one. Uh, and yes, and, and I feel uh, very handicapped in speaking English because I don't, uh, I don't think in English. I have to, to use uh, a quite uh, modest uh, knowledge of, of this language in order to answer questions. Nevertheless, I uh, give lectures in American universities, but I prepare them in advance. Mm -hmm. I read them, I put my accents, have some repetitions with some students, how we pronounce such and such word. And when I have to make an improvisation like this, a conversation that we have, I, I really don't feel a, as a big last public intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's interesting. You talk about the strangeness of language mm. and the way in which that is further complicated by the, mm. the strangeness of speaking in a different mm. language. And you certainly have, have written a book on the figure of mm -hmm. the stranger. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that your arrival in Paris in the 60s as a native Bulgarian speaker mm -hmm. gave you an early kind of uh, insight into or, or presented you with early challenges to wrestle with that, uh, that identity of the stranger as, as an intellectual experience? Yes. Well, of course, I, I felt as an intellectual, but the French has another position in my, uh, my internal experience as uh, compar compared to the English. Because my, my parents uh, had uh, the good idea, nobody says uh, very favorable things about, or not, there are not very many people that say favorable things about their parents, <laughs> but as, because I'm a psychoanalyst, I have a very great <laughs> appreciation for my parents. And be a, be, between these positive things is the fact that they uh, put me in the French kin kindergarten when I was um, about four or five years old. So my, it, it was a kindergarten guided by a French Dominican monks. It's very important because we cross maybe some political and spiritual aspects of modernity uh, that are related to maybe this uh, particular linguistic roots. And uh, I learned uh, French in this uh, mm. kindergarten. And then uh, those uh, Dominican uh, nuns were expelled because they're accused to be spies. And their work was uh, prolonged by uh, l'Alliance Française, uh, which means that I continued to speak French and to read French uh, all over my scholarship until until now, I would say. Bec but English is something else because my parents were not members of the Communist Party, uh, and the high, the, the lycée, um, what is the, the schools, mm, secondary schools of foreign languages, and particularly for English, were uh, reserved for the people from. Uh, children from the nomenclatura, as you mm -hmm. say, the, from the communist origin. So the, the first um, a, a marginalization of, of my uh, being in the world uh, became uh, um, in, because of my, uh, the fact that I cannot follow this school. So it's, uh, you, you speak about the foreigners, uh, I uh, kept, gave the, uh, had the impression from that point on, because of the non-possibility to learn English in the high school, mm -hmm. I felt as a foreigner in my own country. So there are different, asp different kinds of foreigners in, in our world. You can be a foreigner because of your uh, sexual difference, because of your uh, skin, because of, of your political position. Uh, in my uh, youth, this was a particular experience because of the political position of my parents. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in France, uh, when I arrived in France, French society uh, was uh, shocked by uh, the Algerian war 
and uh, um, quite conservative. Uh, but it was not the case of the intellectuals on Saint-Germain-de-Pré, uh, around uh, Roland Barthes, who was already structuralist in the literary field, and uh, uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, of course, and the group Tel Quel, uh, that um, opened their doors and their hearts uh, for me, and I was uh, one of the rare persons coming from Eastern countries uh, with my friend Svetan Todorov, who was uh, in France before me, who translated uh, Russian uh, formalist. I was the one that introduced Mikhail Bakhtin. Some people here maybe know my work about intertextuality, carnival, and so on. And um, the uh, uh, review Tel Kel was very interested by this work. Uh, I met uh, young writers called uh, described as new new novels, new new novelists mm -hmm. after the uh, classical new novel. Uh, I suppose one of them, Philippe Solers, is my husband, and I was introduced in a very um, generous way in this uh, um, intellectual society, without any um, distinction because of my uh, national origins or because of the fact that I am a woman. Mm -hmm. So uh, although there are a lot of discrimination uh, in French academic society too uh, against feminists and f women in general, besides the fact that uh, it's politically correct to be pro-woman uh, and pro-feminist, this is something very important, and we know that it's everywhere the fact. But in these groups, I had the chance to, to have a, a very, very warm um, acceptance and um, generosity. Right. So it's uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, maybe because of this uh, history, I was very uh, sensitive uh, in connection with uh, uh, different foreignness that exists in the French society, mm -hmm. be uh, they uh, national, religious, sexual, etc. And this is the basis of uh, the book that you maybe mentioned, uh, The French Strangers to Ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you were one of the, uh, the editors and major contributors to Tel Quel, mm -hmm. uh, which was, uh, an, was an avant-garde literary journal, but literary and political journal. Uh, that journal had a, a leading role in the, the social upheavals and political upheavals of, of 1960s Paris. Do you see that there is a place on today's cultural landscape, either in France or in the United States, for, a, for an intellectually serious, politically engaged literary magazine? Tel Quel was uh, an important magazine uh, because of uh, mm, a particular period in Europe between the end of the 60s, around 68, and um, I'll say maybe beginning of the 90s, where mm, Marxism uh, and uh, uh, Freudism uh, as uh, uh, I'll say uh, critical deconstructions of Western thought uh, were audible, were capable to be um, widespread in the intellectual circles, and even through television, not only in the university, but even through television. I'm speaking about uh, a particular show, the Bernard Pivot, uh, which, was, which is a presentator on the television. Uh, once a week, uh, there was a show about uh, 20, eight o'clock in the evening with intellectuals speaking about their own works, which is quite rare. Uh, and this is quite important, uh, and it's not now possible mm -hmm. in the same sense uh, because uh, of the, the development of the, what you call the society of the, the show, mm -hmm. the, the entertainment, Société du Spectacle, uh, in the sense that we use in France. Uh, and uh, the, the development also of, of internet, uh, this uh, um, velocity and rapidity of the information, uh, which is uh, very positive in a sense, 
uh, and uh, uh, opens um, the democratic space mm -hmm. of uh, communication, but in the same time, maybe it seems to me, can handicap the uh, deepening of uh, the reflection and the problematization of identity and uh, political uh, events. Nevertheless, uh, it doesn't seem to me that uh, in Europe, in particular, uh, although the place of intellectuals had been narrowed in this new uh, globalization and internet uh, characterized uh, society, uh, that this place disappeared, but it changed. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as poetry and uh, literary style, literary experience, are concerned and literary publications, uh, I think that there's a still uh, a space for magazines. Uh, and uh, the magazine that uh, um, prolonged the life of Telkel, that is called uh, L'Infini, mm -hmm. Infinite it's called. Uh, they uh, published essentially different researches on poetry, on literature, but also on philosophy but also in theology, mm -hmm. but also in uh, um, intercultural relationship, not immediately engaged in political debate, as it could be uh, the fact when uh, we were Marxists, for instance, mm -hmm. and where we can take position uh, pro or against uh, the goal or such after the 68 events, or pro or against uh, the, univer the old university and pro the new kind of uh, interdisciplinary universities that have been built after 68. Uh, but uh, the ethical issues uh, uh, that I think are uh, political in the wide sense of the word are still possible and that we are involved in this. Mm -hmm. As far as I am concerned, I contribute to such a journal, but in the same time I try to go beyond uh, the, the scope of what uh, literary practice can uh, give to uh, a writer, be it novelist or poet, uh, in order to speak to the society and to address the essential points uh, that, um, that characterize the crisis today. For instance, foreigners. For instance, um, handicapped. For instance, religions, mm -hmm. for instance, European culture. On all those uh, um, themes, uh, I was, uh, I hope, uh, in any case, very personally uh, engaged. Uh, to give you uh, just two examples, uh, in my opinion, uh, the clash of religions uh, that uh, we uh, observed in the globalization uh, arises a lot of uh, uh, questions that are very difficult to be solved politically. And one of, the, of them is uh, the um, divorce between theology and politics uh, from the Renaissance, say, but particularly in the Enlightenment. And the French political space is maybe one of those where this divorce is the most radical. Mm -hmm. I am one of uh, the last atheists in this world. I think I'm convinced to be a real atheist. But I consider that this uh, gap between uh, secularization uh, and politics uh, occupying the place of the absolute truth from the one hand and religious as uh, pushed on the private space. This gap uh, has uh, the um, vice uh, to uh, deconsider the ethical uh, dimension of politics. Mm -hmm. And we observe, observe uh, henceforth how politics today is unable to solve uh, existential problems, uh, be they uh, uh, the problems of adolescence, uh, education, uh, differences of sex, mm -hmm. uh, families, 
uh, and also uh, different kinds of uh, uh, identity problems connected with the modern situation. Mm -hmm. So in, in this context, I tried to mobilize my knowledge about uh, human psyche as far as know her, know it, uh, from my literary experience, but also from the psychoanalytic experience, and to address uh, religious uh, um, tradition. And my last works are on uh, the what I call the need to believe and the desire to know, mm -hmm. or uh, a big book that I wrote on the experience of uh, Baroque, a Spanish saint, Saint Teresa of Avila. Mm. And uh, um, I, I'm glad to, to tell you that there will be um, a show in the Le Théâtre Odéon on the last part of this book. Uh, the, the, the role of Teresa of Avila will be interpreted by um, Isabelle Huppert. So oh. it's a great <laughs> joy for me. And uh, it made me, um, Th this kind of work made me uh, address uh, uh, Jewish and uh, uh, Christian tradition. Uh, why Jewish? Because Teresa is from uh, uh, Jewish origin from the part of her father's family. Uh, it's not the purpose of our debate here to get into details of, of this. But uh, to address this situation of Europe, as an inheritor, inheritor of Greek, Jewish, and Catholic tradition with the graft of Muslim tradition today that takes a much more place, and to interpret it from the point of view of what I know as structuralist, as feminist, and as psychoanalyst, and to make a sort of uh, kaleidoscopic debate between these components of uh, our tradition that mm -hmm. is also European, but I think uh, generally universal and particularly um, concerns uh, United States and South America too. And I suppose that it's from this, uh, from the basis of this experience that I was invited last year, now makes me a year and a half ago, by uh, the previous Pope, Benedict XVI, in a meeting, exceptional meeting, in this wonderful city of Assisi, where you, you have this wonderful frescoes of Giotto, which is the beginning of the Renaissance. Uh, the meeting uh, where uh, were invited all the religions of the world, plus, for the first time, the non-believers, a delegation of non-believers, uh, in which uh, were represented uh, Mm, different academics, which means that there are other academics. I'm not on the last one <laughs> to participate in these debates. Uh, there there are was, lots of academics. There are just very few great public intellectuals. <laughs> so, well, yes, I, but they were there. They're public intellectuals discussing with the Pope. So, well, not the, the only one. But I was the chief. Yeah. So I, I was, uh, as a woman, I suppose, because yeah. they want to. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the guilt of men push some women on the <laughs> Well, you mention your 2006 book with that, that uh, extraordinary title, This Incredible Need to Believe. Um, and in that book, you express some real concern about, uh, about the, the growth and the nature of fundamentalism, of, of religious fundamentalism throughout the world, religious fundamentalism, fundamentalisms, uh, but also you express some skepticism about what you call the dead end of secular society. Mm. And in that book, you look to some conventional and some, I think, unconventional places uh, for potential alternative sources of, mm. of belief. Um, so you look to pre-religious mm. impulses towards belief, you look to the Pope, and at, at that, in, in that book you were referring to uh, Pope John Paul II, mm -hmm. and you referred, as you did just now, to adolescence. Mm -hmm. um, in English, we have a phrase, strange bedfellows. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, uh, it seems to me that this, this triad of pre-religious belief, mm -hmm. the Pope, mm -hmm. and adolescence makes strange, <laughs> strange bedfellows, this strange triad. I was wondering if you would 
talk a little more about what you see as the through lines or the continuity mm -hmm. amongst those three groups, concepts, mm -hmm. subjects? Yes, we, we ask me too much things uh, uh, to say this in English. It, uh, it's a real, real, real trial, uh, of course. And, you know, this, this uh, conversation was supposed to be on Christopher's couch, but you put me on the couch. You made me <laughs> speak about things that I, I wrote about, uh, I hope in a very uh, clear way, but it's difficult to, to sum them up. Um, it's... Uh, uh, well, uh, I get the impression that uh, a psychoanalytic um, experience, which is uh, discredited uh, this last uh, decade, and the psychoanalysts uh, have a great responsibility in this discredit because uh, my colleagues uh, don't uh, want to, um, to, to expose their um, science or their interpretations on the public space and don't take, uh, don't, don't participate very much in the debates, including um, humanistic on human crisis. And I do this, um, and particularly as far as uh, the experience of uh, uh, belief is uh, concerned. And you notice that. Uh, so, um, uh, I, I occupy my position of the analyst in this couch uh, by trying to explain how uh, psychoanalysis can be, um, not by analyzing you, be quiet, <laughs> but just uh, by saying how I, I think that psychoanalysis can intervene in, uh, in the nowadays crisis, particularly as far as uh, this dimension of belief is uh, concerned. Mm, to, to put it briefly, mm, uh, Freud was not very much interested by adolescence. Uh, and I think because uh, he was uh, maybe the more, uh, the most, uh, uh, the, the biggest unbeliever in the world. It's the, the very, very strong rationalist and uh, um, atheist, even maybe stronger than me, which is difficult, but he was. <laughs> And he was very in, much interested by the child, uh, because the child is, uh, as he said, a polymorphous pervert, which is not a negative description, but which is maybe something close to the topic of, of uh, your festival here. He, uh, the child has an uh, excited body, maybe not an animal, but uh, quite uh, close to the instinctual drives. And uh, this excitation makes him very curious. And the child uh, asks questions. He wants to know where children come from, for instance. But from that point on, uh, the child is very curious. And he, uh, Freud described the child as a researcher, a researcher in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. The adolescent is not this. The adolescent is a, a child, a, a bad child, or the bad uh, individual that grow up, that uh, want to kill his parents and to, to, to put them aside anyhow, and to, to do more than them. And he thinks, or she thinks, that the ideal is possible, more ideal than his or her parents. The child is a believer that the ideal exists. You can see when you find, for instance, the big figures of adolescence in Western culture, be they Adam and Eve, Dante and Beatrice, Romeo and Juliet, they, they believe that the paradise exists uh, because they are in love. Love is an ideal. Paradise is that love is possible. And we are all adolescents when we are in love. But in the, the smallest deception, uh, this paradise uh, falls in pieces and the, the adolescent become nihilist. Nothing exists. Mm -hmm. It's rubbish. Um, I am uh, depressed. You've I'm met anorectic. my children. <laughs> you've, you've met my children. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I, I was like that, too. But uh, as a psychoanalyst, I try to, to be in an osmosis with you and your children, but not to be like that. But I have to pass through this uh, identification mm -hmm. with this critical point. So what we have to do, uh, we have to consider that the believer is a conflictual personality. He or she needs identity, 
and this identity being impossible, uh, it, uh, this, uh, this, this, this defeat of the ideal opens the way to the death wish, to the violence. And the adolescent, to give, uh, take this example, um, converts this uh, violence against himself or herself. Uh, we have here the anorectic symptoms, the toxicomania, and the other uh, um, suicidal uh, situations also. Uh, depression uh, is also one of the, the issues of this violence um, conveyed to the person. But mm -hmm. he or she can also direct it on the others, on the other religion, on the other power mm -hmm. of those who wounded him and become a victim to the propaganda of the fundamentalists. Uh, I am very much interested by, by this analysis of the limit states of the adolescent as a believer and as mm -hmm. a nihilist, as a violent bomb, in a sense. Uh, and that's why we try to find out on a technical, psychoanalytic or um, psychotherapeutic um, level how to deal with uh, those people and how to give them a recognition of this need to believe and to, to accompany them uh, in, in, in their um, acting out. And now, uh, this is a technical problem of those that come to psychoanalysis, but there is a social problem, how to give ideals to our adolescents, how uh, to develop uh, the um, educational system in order not to give them religions or to accompany them to uh, examine religions from a critical point of view. And here, I think we uh, intellectuals are also very useful if they try to accomplish their vocation. Example, in France, our uh, Minister of Education uh, is preparing a sort of uh, um, legislation about uh, uh, the secu secular education, mm -hmm. saying in some uh, uh, points uh, what are uh, the necessary moral uh, obligations to be observed by every student uh, and every uh, schoolboy, schoolgirl too. Uh, it's called uh, la charte de la laïcité, uh, the secular uh, mm. what is it? charte, charter, whatever. Charter. Yeah. Uh, and I say that's okay. Why not? It's necessary because there, we have a lot of people that are. Um, under the influence of fundamentalists that don't uh, uh, want that girls go to the swimming pool, etc. Et mm -hmm. But I think that it's not enough that we have uh, to uh, teach history of religions in schools in every level of the education in order to uh, appropriate this tradition in a more objective way and to give knowledge to all the immigrants Mm -hmm. of what their tradition is, and also to problematize it, and to make religion an object of discussion, to open their minds through uh, human sciences, through sociology, ethnology, anthropology, psychoanalysis, to make them capable to discuss Judaism, Christianity, um, Taoism or Muslim mm -hmm. religions, etc. And it is, the, the, I think, the humanistic way to uh, prevent them to succumb to the propaganda. Right. Well, this is one of the, the interventions of the public mm -hmm. intellectual, if you want. Well, that's interesting because in, in that same book, in this incredible need to believe, you also talked about, and I, and I take you right now to be, to be have been talking about the importance of what we in America call multiculturalism, mm -hmm. uh, cosmopolitanism as part of the, the ethics of education. Mm -hmm. But in this incredible need to believe, you also warn about or you also say that humanism needs to be reformed to make it less hostile or less mm -hmm. antagonistic mm -hmm. towards belief. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk about some of the things that you, some of the strands in humanism 
as we currently understand it, and understand it that need to be rethought, re renovated, perhaps even guarded against? Thank you very much. It's a very important question. This is one of my topics in which I'm ready to be more engaged. This is <laughs> the, the one uh, of them, and the other one is uh, Mm, the, the European uh, Union and the multilingualism, mm -hmm. but I think they go together. Uh, the humanism is uh, considered by a uh, lot of serious people, maybe you <laughs> between them, and particularly philosophers, as uh, a weak um, and maybe archaic state of philosophy, mm. uh, because uh, because uh, it's identified either with a um, uh, return to a Greek and Roman tradition, uh, study uh, Greek and Latin in schools, or to uh, the um, uh, uh, secularized uh, dogmaticism, uh, which uh, um, considered a religious experience as only an illusion, and also uh, in some uh, extreme uh, aspects of this secularism, persecuted religions, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, the case, for instance, in communist society. Uh, and uh, uh, in the final range, uh, this caricature of, of uh, humanism has been uh, very uh, profoundly attacked and deconstructed by the important book of Sartre, uh, Existentialism et un Humanism, where he uh, attacked this uh, caricature of humanism as uh, a religion of the outer religion and uh, tried to reestablish the part of uh, requirement for freedom as an essential aspect of this uh, uh, humanism. So he rehabilitated humanism as an urgency for uh, freedom. Uh, very close to the text of Sartre, we have uh, the Heidegger letters on humanism, where he expresses uh, a very uh, hostile, critical attitude against this hidden religion that is uh, in the uh, heart of this lay humanism, mm -hmm. which puts himself as a sort of theomorphism. But even in this text of Heidegger, you find a recognition of what I consider to be a germ of humanism. The one is poetry. Okay, the humanism is a religion. We don't follow it in this direction. But the poetic experience that tries to reconcile the body and the language, and mm. we can reach one of the aspects of your a festival here, I suppose, is uh, a, a promise for the humanism. And the other aspect of the Heideggerian text is the end of it, while well, he speaks about uh, the um, pace of the peasant on the earth, uh, which means the proximity of the humble people uh, to, uh, uh, to the sense of the life which is also in the center of the humanism, poetry and the everyday person. Now, if I take into account this discussion over humanism, I say that humanism and this criticism, this rejection, or this kind of critical reappropriation by Sartre or by Heidegger, I say that humanism is not a system, that humanism is not a theomorphism, that humanism is a permanent reconstruction and permanent refoundation. And I do this from the Nietzschean point of view, and uh, I quote very often, I quoted this in Assisi in this forum uh, with do, the Pope. Do you, mean, do you mean permanent as in ongoing? Ongoing. As, okay. Perpetual. Perpetual, ongoing. yeah, okay. permanent maybe yeah. is perpetual, yes, in English. Thank you for correcting me. When uh, uh, Nietzsche says that we have to put a great, great quotation mark on the most serious problems. And humanism is what puts a great quotation mark on the more important problems. 
And those problems are God and human. So we don't know what it is. You never will know entirely, definitively, systematically. You have to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, how? By favorizing human sciences. Because after the discrepancy of the theological uh, continent through the Renaissance, through the Enlightenment, uh, what uh, emerged are human sciences. And we have to develop them in a more uh, lucid and exigent way in order to give to them new object of discussion by interdisciplinary studies and by, uh, by new continents of curiosity, uh, like, for instance, uh, Mm, gender studies, uh, mm -hmm. handicap, old age, um, multiculturalism, and so on and so on. So this permanent interrogation is for me the, the, uh, what humanism is. And, and I think you've exemplified it in your own work as well. I, in, I, I was rereading um, uh, about Chinese women, mm -hmm. uh, your book about Chinese women, which is 40 years uh, ago now, and or not quite that, but uh, I, I remember there, there, you had a kind of prescient comment about the way, this, I guess it was back in 1980, um, you commented that the experience uh, and the, the politics raised by, uh, by gay men, you didn't say same sex, but gay men specifically, because you're talking about the position of the woman, the culturalized position of woman in, in our culture, was something that uh, held forth the promise of making sure that feminism yeah. would, would continue to be a feminist we, a new, mm -hmm. um, and not become simply, a, as you said, a secret female society. So mm -hmm. I, I see your work as always having looked for the broadest kind of mm -hmm. inclusiveness and always kind of restlessly looking for different kinds of inclusions and different kinds of plurality. Mm -hmm. Now, I... Um, we have I, no time? <laughs> yeah, I uh, have only asked the smallest fraction of mm -hmm. the questions that I would love to be able to ask you, but I promised the festival organizers that I would get down off the couch and let all of you get on Julia Kristeva's couch uh, at this point. So I think we're going to shift the proportion of lighting. Ah, voilà, um, ça on le voit. Oui, and, très bien, merci. Uh, uh, it wasn't a laugh track, they really were there. Um, and there are a couple of people circulating with, um, with microphones. Uh, and uh, if you have a question to ask Professor Kristeva, if you could just put up your hand and, uh, okay, here we go. Um, so what do you think about current Russia where from one sense religion get pushed forward? I, I, I don't hear you. Do you hear? I can't, I can't quite hear which. Hello? No? Oh, yes. Okay. What could you say about current Russia where religion pushed ahead by Putin and in the same times as you call other is attacked, like homosexual, whatever you want? How you can think about it that in the middle of Europe, now this regression sort of is very active and actually nobody protests about it. So the question is about Russia and... And Europe. Uh, is a, uh, what is the regression of Europe? Uh, I understand the question about uh, Putin that encourages religion, and, uh, and, but I couldn't uh, get the question about Re Europe. Okay. So I am talking about what happened in Russia now. Yes, the, I understand Russia, right. but Europe, so the last Europe one. does not react on this clear regression that in Russia basically very negative things happened in the same time. Then you have all others, other kind of cult cultural and everything, painters like Pussy Riot, whatever. They attacked by state and religion instead pushed forward. So you have conceptually intellectual regression of huge country in the middle of Europe, and Europe is silent. Oh, well, so, <laughs> I, I think that you are right about uh, uh, the um, uh, rise of religion in, in Russia. It was uh, uh, something that is uh, a, a great concern for me because I was impressed when I was invited in Russian universities uh, to, uh, to see uh, 
the, the religious mass and uh, the icons in the laboratories. It's something very impressive for me because, uh, it, of course, it's not the, fa the, the fact before. But I understood that as a, a return of the repressed uh, something very, very well known by the, the psychoanalysts when uh, the communist uh, politics was uh, so um, uncomprehensive against this experience, uh, there is a, a sort of uh, uh, exaggerated revival uh, that is supposed for some people that uh, suffered from the re repression to be a sort of freedom for them. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the government, and uh, Mr. Putin was, is a very um, subtle, uh, maybe it's not the same, but very, very um, vicious is maybe a better word, but competent in this sense, politician. He utilizes this uh, uh, hope that people put on religion in order to transform it into a support of, of his power. Uh, and from that point of view, what I say, uh, it goes against such kind of utilization of religion. I think that it's not possible to uh, eradicate it, to, uh, to, to abolish religion. It was what uh, secularism had done uh, for centuries after the uh, Enlightenment. What is necessary is to analyze it, to problematize it, to criticize it, and it is done by rational way, in schools, by intellectuals, on the television. That's what we have to impose in the European space, which is not the space of, of Russia. So uh, I, I couldn't understand what, what is the linkage that we make between um, Russia and Europe. But our European approach is religion, okay, but we have to discuss you. You, religious people, your religious dogmas, your attitudes towards uh, freedom, etc. And if we can have some, uh, some, some places of uh, mutual understanding in order to combat uh, fundamentalism or terrorism, in this sense, we'll tr work together. But when you are against women, we'll not follow you. So this is possible in the European field. It's not possible in Russia. I'm yeah. not sure that uh, yeah. answered the question, but that's the way I understood it. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. In, in your conversation today, I didn't hear the word Eastern religions or meditation or anything in that vein. There must be a reason for that. The, the question was whether there is a reason that, that you and I didn't talk about Eastern religions or meditation or anything in that vein. Well, I think that it was not exactly the, the we don't have enough time to deal with all those questions. It was just some, uh, some um, invitation in a more general way uh, that you can develop, I think, yourself by your questions. Uh, as, if your question is addressed to me as uh, com somebody coming from the Orthodox Christianity, I have to tell you something very personal. In my family, my, my father was Orthodox Christian and a great admirer of Dostoevsky. And my mother, who has some Jewish roots, but uh, very, very for some generations and forgotten, uh, she was uh, the atheist and the Darwinian. And I was the uh, boy of the family, and I accepted my um, mother's uh, Darwinism in order to attack my father. We considered himself as a um, dinosaur and archaic uh, person, etc. And it's only when I came in France that I began to read uh, the, the religious continent, if I can say, the Bible, the Gospels, and the theology, and uh, also the different other religions. Uh, in order to, to try to understand and interpret them. So I think it's not possible to eradicate this kind of um, anthropological constant that is the need to believe, religions being the different answers to this anthropological mm -hmm. need, but we can interpret it and uh, try to, to make uh, um, 
bridges between different religions. Do we have any more questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, thank you very much for speaking with us. Um, over here, this way. <laughs> uh, my question uh, has, sorry. My question has to do with um, what seems to be uh, endemic lately uh, in the US, which is the sort of young adolescent men committing uh, violent atrocities on a sort of mass scale, and wondering if you could share some specifically psychoanalytic insights um, as to this situation. I'm thinking uh, Newtown, Connecticut, Boulder, Colorado, Virginia Tech, it seems to be the last 10 years, so that's my question, thank you. Uh, well, um, I, I don't know exactly what is this case, it's difficult to to speak without knowing, but it, uh, it's somebody that... A series of, there, there have been a number of mass mm. shootings, mm. Uh, mostly perpetrated by Young younger people. men. Mm. Uh, I, I connect this with the, the Chechen people that uh, uh, shoot uh, the marathon in uh, mm -hmm. Yale. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm very much concerned with this, and uh, the paper that I presented um, uh, on the humanity, no, it was uh, on Wednesday, uh, on, uh, what was it exactly the topic of the French cultural that she will tell me uh, about that. Uh, it's something about the humanities um, and the crisis of the humanities in the universities. So we tried in a, a webinar to, to, to talk about uh, the necessity to develop human sciences. And I gave an example uh, the, uh, how um, clinical psychology and psychoanalysis can um, try to elucidate what happens in the psyche of those uh, despaired adolescents. Uh, we, uh, how to summarize this? You, you, you are maybe familiar with the Kantian notion of the radical evil. Uh, Hannah Arendt took this notion of radical evil, saying uh, that uh, the radical evil is uh, when some people decide to uh, take the life of other people. Uh, the, the killing, the murder, is the radical evil. Uh, how some people can uh, reach such kind of situation? such kind of, uh, of stand of mind to be able to do this radical evil. Uh, religions consider this, uh, some of them, as a sin. Others uh, utilize it in order to fight the other religion. Uh, for us psychologists and psychoanalysts, uh, this uh, uh, stand of mind is due to the fact I will speak with Freudian terms, that uh, we have two um, mental components, uh, two essential mental components. The one is uh, the erotic component, the uh, uh, excitation that goes in the sense of procreation, of love, of uh, um, sexual intercourse, tenderness, or whatever, there are a lot of uh, aspects of this erotic tendency. The other one is violence that we crossed a little bit before, and this violence is uh, called by Freud the death wish. When the uh, psychic uh, identity of an uh, adolescent is built, uh, when the need of to believe, the need of ideality is satisfied, the uh, uh, violence, the death wish, is integrated in this uh, identity search. I want, I will be aggressive in order to achieve something ideal. Uh, and my ideal will prevent me to be cruel because uh, my ideals, if they are uh, in uh, the, the, the frame of the love, which is the other uh, fundamental aspect, will prevent me to uh, distract, to destroy other human lives. But there are situations where the psychic apparatus, the psychic identity, 
uh, has not satisfied the ideal uh, wish. And uh, we uh, assist in a, what is called falling into pieces, uh, which is a sort of uh, um, dismantling of the identity. I don't know who I am. There is nobody in the place of the ego. Uh, we can describe this as a schizophrenic or paranoid, but any, any, anyhow is a psychotic experience where the ego is abolished. And it is overwhelmed by a violence which is experienced like, either like a void, it's a sort of possession, hallucination, I don't know who I am, there is nothing around me, either by the pleasure to, uh, from the violence itself. And in this situation, people go to uh, a, a sort of uh, obscurity in which they can kill uh, their uh, similars. That's what happened uh, with people that uh, we have also in France, a uh, man uh, is called Mera in the South France in Toulouse, who killed for some soldiers that were in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, excuse me, and then uh, children from the Jewish school. So they, they, uh, th this uh, destruction of the identity of those people makes them victims for uh, the integrists that utilize them in the propaganda, pre, um, promising them uh, either uh, some uh, material compensations, many uh, money, some uh, arms, uh, some pleasures, or uh, uh, ideal religious promise to be recompensed as a future sense in the above life. And uh, in, in, in this, this kind of uh, uh, no possession of their identity and per uh, absolute submission to the dictatorship of, of, uh, of the, the uh, integrist, they are able to, to do these acts. So uh, our attitude is to try to uh, you speak uh, with the parents of uh, such persons in South France, uh, to uh, detect the, the, the first signs of this destruction of the identity, a schizophrenic or paranoid attitude, in order to prevent them to uh, become uh, uh, victims of this situation. Uh, this is one uh, of the approaches. And I think it's more subtle than to say only uh, we failed to integrate them um, because they are people from the um, immigration. Uh, they, they, there was no respect for them and they don't have uh, enough education. Uh, sometimes this destruction of their identity is so uh, cruel and so fundamental that they don't want, they are incapable to follow education. Uh, the European Committee have a, a sort of uh, um, expression to describe uh, this population. They call them needs, no education, uh, employee and training. They are unable to follow this. But if they are unable, it's also our fault. What can we do in order to make them able? To give them work, it's too much to give them education, they cannot follow school. You have to bring them a family, to bring them uh, recognition, to bring them knowledge, uh, to make them psychological care, and to begin a work from the basis. Uh, so uh, this is an example of the critical situation of the modern society that reaches your uh, preoccupation here because you speak very much about the um, financial crisis, political crisis. Here you reach human crisis. And I'm very much concerned by that because I think that maybe other society before us have experienced such kind of situations. But now because of the widespread information, you know about that more. And also because we have more knowledge, you are more capable to prevent this. But uh, politics doesn't give us enough place to, for, to do so. It's maybe up to you 
to us, uh, to intellectuals, to, to, to set an alarm about that and to, to bring the attention of the, the political circles about the necessity to uh, accompany human being in some uh, uh, spheres of the populations in order to prevent such kind of, uh, of difficulties. Just an, uh, another anecdote that goes in this direction. Uh, I was given uh, the Dr. Honoris Causa of the University of uh, um, Argentina uh, last year and uh, uh, in Buenos Aires, the um, president of the university told me that uh, they have uh, students from the suburbs where uh, no policy, no, no, no uh, the police, the police, okay. no police can enter uh, because uh, there are a lot of drugs, a lot of crimes, a lot of arms. Uh, so what, what they do? They try to um, intervene through uh, social workers and when the social workers have, because of their uh, ethical and psychological attitude, capable to save some youngsters from these um, influences and put them in schools and bring them to the university. He, th this, uh, this director told me, I want to transform them into researchers. Which is very interesting, how do you do this? Does it mean, uh, I said to him, that you want to respect them? Because this notion of respect is utilized in Brazil by humanists in Brazil in order to, to say in the same situation, the only thing to do uh, in connection with those people, these youngsters, is to respect them. And this is the, the, the degree zero of the education. I think, okay, do you respect them? It's not enough. I want to make them think that what they have experienced is to be problematized. And I give them as a, a university work to uh, make a thesis on their own life or how they became criminals, how they became drug, mm -hmm. drug addict, how they become uh, involved in armed traffic, and so, etc. So this this uh, problematization of, of the vices of the society became an object of their laboratories. I was very much impressed and say, "May how how did you arrive to this conclusion? Are you sociologists? Are you follower of Bourdieu or Christeva?" He said, "No, no. It's get the impression that he was a little mm. bit." Uh, Mm, disturbed and uh, prudent, uh, modest, uh, but I insisted, and he said, me, but I, uh, what was the word thesis? He said, I uh, made the thesis on theology mm. in Germany, and what was your topic? Uh, he said, um, e Master Eckhart. <laughs> Master Eckhart is a very important uh, mystic in Germany in the 12th mm. century, he, who said this very interesting statement, I asked, I asked God to make me free from God. Mm. And uh, one of the, uh, it makes me speak about a little bit more than me because you asked me to speak about uh, my writings. Uh, particularly, uh, I was involved for 10 years in writing a book on St. Teresa, and she says something like uh, Maître Eckhart, but more in a more playful and maybe more feminine way, not so much conceptual, I asked God to make me free from God. She says to the sisters in the monastery, uh, you know that it's forbidden to um, play in monasteries, but I allow you to uh, play in monasteries, and particularly to play chess. Why? She was a very good uh, chess player. Because you make chess a chess mat to God himself. <laughs> which is very interesting from the point of view of a saint. Mm -hmm. And it's, she doesn't say you have to destroy God. You have to play with him. It's a sort of meditation, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, with sort of humor, and it takes a, a place for a joke and for a play, which is a sort of sublimation too. So we have to find in a lay, secular, humanistic grounds such attitude of elucidation and pleasure in order that our adolescents don't succumb either to discrepancy, either to a cruel 
um, paranoization. Well, thank you. I, I'm afraid we are at the end of our time. So uh, please join me in expressing our gratitude to Professor Kristeva.